we can start. I don't want to see messages. Just for people who are on, uh, if you want to send, uh, if you want to raise questions, feel free to speak up, but also you can send messages on the Simon Observatory Slack channel, pixel tutorials, pixel underscore tutorials. All right, so we're gonna get started now. So in this tutorial, I'm gonna introduce Pixel, um, which is a software for analyzing maps of the sky. Um, before we start with some basic introduction stuff, uh, we should just dive straight in and clone the tutorial GitHub so that you can open up the notebook. So I'm just gonna do that here. So I'll make a directory. Uh, can people see the text in the terminal? Okay, or should I increase the uh, font size? It's a little bit small. Yeah, a little bit of help the old people. this uh, repository by typing in git clone, copying and pasting this in. Um, so I already have that clone here, pixel tutorials. And then you can open up the notebook. And if you already had this uh, directory, make sure to get pull so that it gets updated. All right. Oh, it opened up in my giant non incognito window, but it's fine. Let's we'll do that from there. Okay, so um, let's first load these modules. So just run this cell. And then we're gonna set things up so that we download two fairly small files into the directory. So that's the, uh, one of the act CMD maps and a uh, catalog of clusters. There's an additional file that you need to download, uh, which is the Plonk, which is a Plonk map. It's a full sky map. So it's a little bit big. So let's just do that in the background. So you can go to the terminal, open another one. And, uh, and then just say, you know, copy in that, um, in that uh, command that W gets the Plonk map. So that's just gonna run in the background. Okay, so while these things are downloading, let's just uh, come back. Show that here. Okay. So let's come back to the slides and we'll just talk about the basics of Pixel for a little bit. All right, so the, so the idea behind Pixel is that you can load in maps that are in rectangular pixel station. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that means. And once you load it in these maps, so this, this includes maps from, from the ACT experiment, and also for, uh, from the SPT experiment, and future maps from the advanced ACT experiment. Um, once you load in these maps, you can do Fourier transforms, two-dimensional two Fourier transforms of images to do analysis on these, on these maps. You can also do spherical harmonic transforms. You can reproject and interpolate between different pixel stations, including UPIX, so we'll see examples of that in the tutorial. Um, there's also capability to simulate maps of the CMD. In fact, the simulations that we run uh, for ACT and the Simons Observatory are generated by the pixel library. Um, and these maps can then be lensed by the convergence field uh, in the universe that we expect. Uh, they can also be modulated and evaporated for, to, to account for the Earth's uh, motion with respect to the CMB frames. So all of these things are capabilities that are already in Pixel. That's being used both as an analysis and simulation uh, tool. And you can also do simple simulations of point sources that are shaped by the beam, among many other things. But what it cannot do, uh, so it's not a code that's meant for a proper, you know, full power spectrum pipeline where you have more with codes like MAMASTER and PS5 and 
PDAs and other tools that, um, that are specialized for that, but that's not something that Pixel can do. Uh, Pixel cannot do lensing reconstruction, for example. That's codes like SimLens, Flafo, um, Lenset, and you know, several other uh, public codes that can do that. And also, to properly find and characterize clusters and sources, uh, you want to use codes like NEMA. So that's, that's not something that's in the scope of Pixel. Um, but I should point out that many of these codes, probably all of the ones listed here, actually depend on Pixel. So they use Pixel as a core library uh, for analyzing for and man manipulating uh, maps of the, the sky and rectangular pixelization. So what do I mean by rectangular pixelization? Um, it's best to contrast with Helpix, which is very widely used by Planck and WMAP, for example. Um, so the Helpix pixelization is a scheme for mapping equal area divisions of the sky onto a one-dimensional area, right? Um, so anytime you observe the sky, which is a sphere, you want to map it and analyze it. Uh, uh, if you want to map it and analyze it, you want to represent it in pixels in computer memory. Helpix does this by dividing the sky into equal area divisions and mapping it into one-dimensional array. Um, so what I mean by rectangular pixelization is any scheme that uh, maps uh, the sky into a two-dimensional array uh, with rectangular pixels. Uh, so, so these rectangular pixelations are widely used in geophysics and astronomy, including ENACT and SPT, CMB maps. And there's many different ways to do it. So uh, with Helpix, there's just a few different schemes like nested in ring and at different possible resolutions. But with, with rectangular pixelation, there's a whole ecosystem of different possible ways to do it that corresponds to different projections of the sky. Um, so here I'm showing, for example, you know, just a schematic representation of mapping the sky in, into a cylindrical projection, then pixelizing it in a two-dimensional area. Um, so each of these pixelizations have their pros and cons. We won't debate them here, but I'm obviously going to start at least taking some of my biases during these notebook sessions. Um, but I'll just point out that Helpix maps, there's an excellent package, uh, package called, Python package called Helpi, which can be used to analyze them. Um, and so you can kind of think of Pixel as the analog of HealPy for analyzing um, rectangular pixelation maps. One important thing to note that you, you're probably already familiar with is that these different pixelizations are uh, unified by the whole coordinate system standard. So just a really quick summary of what that means. Um, it's a standard that defines um, certain key value pairs uh, that tell you how, like once it's in the header of a file, um, different software can use that information to, to understand how you should be able to map the pixel index on a 2D grid to a sky coordinate or back. And that's all the information that you need to analyze a map and, and make physical inferences from it, right? So you're laying out what the projection is, what the pixel uh, width is, what the reference pixel is, et cetera. And once you have that information in, you can map it between pixel indices and sky coordinates, and that's all you need to do everything you would want to do with the map. Um, I do want to uh, uh, you know, point out a misconception that I've widely seen, uh, which you know, is uh, completely wrong. Rectangular position is not you know, in, some, in, some, in, in any uh, way uh, a flat sky representation. So this is, again, because of the point that I just made that you, know, you have all of the information you need in this pixel index to sky coordinate on the sphere transformation that's embedded in the, in the WCS. So both Hulebeck's and rectangular position have this, their information preserving up to pixel averaging um, that maps sky coordinates to memory locations. The fact that the rectangular pixelation, pixel station is laying it out in a 2D grid does not in any way make it flat sky representation. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, Hulebeck lays it out in one dimension, so the average would be even flatter, right? Um, whether or not you make a flat sky approximation depends on the details of what you do with those pixels. Um, if, for example, you use Fourier transforms, which are defined on a Cartesian grid, instead of spherical harmonics, and that's the point at which you've made a flat sky approximation. That's one possible place that you could make, make a flat sky approximation. Um, but in, in general, a rectangular position maps can be analyzed with spherical harmonics. In fact, there are advantages uh, for using using rectangular pixelation when you're doing calculating spherical harmonics. Um, and in particular, Pixel has interfaces with uh, the Lipshark library to allow for a full sky, uh, you know, proper spherical harmonic analysis. Um, I'll also just point out that uh, the specific 
outer of uh, rectangular position that we've been using in ACT uh, are two different forms of cylindrical projections. Previously, a pixel station that was equal area, but in upcoming uh, ACT releases, it will be a slightly different one which doesn't have equal area, but has this really simple transformation between latitude and longitude, or right ascension and declination, and pixel index. Um, you might worry that these systems are a little bit weird at the poles, but in practice, this never actually causes any problems, uh, even for full sky maps. Um, you can, uh, it's, it's a, it, yeah, it, it, there, there's no issues in, in analyzing full sky maps, even in, in these projections, even though, you know, technically speaking, the, in this projection, uh, I think the pixel area uh, approaches zero as you go to the poles. Okay, but uh, the great thing is that you don't have to think about these projections. That's the idea behind Pixel, is that it just abstracts away all of that stuff. Um, and whether you load up a map in the old ACT Pixel station of CEA or the upcoming uh, advanced ACT uh, Pixel station of CAR or use existing SPT maps in the ZEA, which is, which is not so cylindrical, it doesn't matter, you can analyze these maps with the Pixel, you can do the same analysis um, with the same code. Uh, and, and, and shouldn't matter. Okay, so that's that's it for the basic introduction. We're going to dive into the notebook in a bit. Um, the outline is uh, that hopefully by now your ACT map and cluster catalog have been downloaded, um, and the plot map might take a little bit like, uh, a little uh, while more. It's two gigabytes. Um, but once those are loaded, um, we can we're going to load in the rectangle position ACT map and inspect it. Uh, just to understand what the code structure of Pixel is like. And then we're going to plot the map in various ways. So Pixel has some nice visualization tools. Um, and we're going to inspect uh, a point source. So let's say someone told us that there's a point source at a certain location. We're going to look at it. We're going to look at the point source, put a stamp cut out, and do some analysis around it. Um, we're going to make a poor man's version of a, of a match filter to look for objects in this map. Uh, we're going to calculate a very simple power spectrum. So even though I mentioned that Pixel is not meant to be used for you know, precision analysis of power spectrum, there are codes for that. Often when you're doing analysis, you just want to have a quick look at the map, quick look at the power spectrum, um, just to make sure it's sane. So you can do diagnostic power spectrum of Pixel very easily, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, oops. And uh, importantly, you know, we also want to be able to analyze maps of ACT and SO jointly with Plonk. So those maps are in Helpix, but you can easily reproject those maps to the ACT pixel station and then, for example, cross correlate to compare the theory, which we'll also do. Um, we're going to write some code today to stack on the ACT clusters in one of these public maps. Uh, if this time, we'll uh, maybe try and do sort of harmonics. Uh, uh, live and, and maybe also look into making mass. Okay, great. So uh, if you if you join late, uh, you can clone this repository here. This is the information. Uh, the command to clone the repository is here. Uh, CD into the directory and open it up in Jupyter. And so we'll just switch to uh, to the notebook. Uh, but but I'll take questions if there are any. Okay, um, if you can't see the text in the notebook, uh, well, uh, let me know. The font size is not enough. All right, so as I mentioned, we're going to, we're, we're going to be working with maps uh, that are real data. Um, so there are public maps from a previous act, act release uh, and a cluster catalog, and we'll be looking at these. Um, so the first thing you want to do is make sure that uh, well, so I am assuming that you have installed Pixel at this point. So this tutorial is not going to be about how to install Pixel. Instructions were sent out in an email earlier. Um, so assuming you have Pixel in, uh, installed, uh, you can import various modules from Pixel by just saying from Pixel import nmap and utils. So nmap and utils are very commonly used um, modules within, within Pixel. Let's do that. Um, I've already downloaded these files. Okay, so if you, if you run this cell, uh, you will have a, uh, a deep six uh, fits, uh, an, an act map uh, in, in fits format in the same directory as uh, the tutorial, uh, plus three. 
to read in a map, uh, you can use the nmap module and just say read map. Okay. So um, what this uh, does is to, it, it, it opens up the FITS file, looks in the, in the FITS headers, and then loads in a map. A really important point I want to make around here is that the way that maps work in Pixel is by uh, Pixel basically extends the NumPy array. So if you're familiar with working with NumPy arrays, then Pixel is really fun to use because anything that you can do to a NumPy array, you can, uh, it inherits all of the properties of NumPy array, but it extends on top of that by adding this WCS object, which we, as we just talked about is a whole coordinate system object. So this particular command is going to load in the FITS header. Um, it's going to take the, the data that's in the FITS file and put it into uh, a NumPy array, but it's actually an extension of a NumPy array that it contains not just all the properties of a NumPy array, but also a WCS object. So let's do that. Um, let me just clear all the cells here because that's, uh, that's more fun. Yeah, if anyone knows how to clear the outputs of a uh, IPython notebook, you should speak up right now. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Uh, I guess, right, that's fine. All right, so um, once this is loaded in, the uh, uh, we're going to print out the shape and, and, and D type or data type uh, of, of this NumPy array. And you can see it's a uh, two dimensional array with shape uh, 1505 and 3521, which means that uh, there's 1505 pixels along the y direction and 3521 along the x direction. Um, and this is uh, the, you know, the most basic structure that you can have in, in, in an ND map, which is an extension of a NumPy array. It should have at least two dimensions. And the two rightmost axes, those, uh, when you're using this for maps of the sky, they send celestial coordinates. And what they map on to depend on the coordinate system that's in, in, the, uh, in the maps. Uh, but almost always, you're gonna be using the equatorial coordinate system uh, for maps from ground-based uh, zero trees. Um, and in that case, the y-axis here corresponds to the declination direction, and the x-axis here corresponds to the right ascension direction. Okay, so this is telling me that this uh, is a, uh, is a uh, at least it has properties of NumPy array that has so many pixels in the declination and right ascension direction and has a data type of uh, uh, so it's a 64-bit float. Um, but, you know, that doesn't tell me where it's on the sky, uh, uh, but that's exactly why there's this WCS object that's attached to the FITS file, uh, which Unlike a regular NumPy array, this, this, uh, this, this particular ND map has it. Um, this just prints out a summary of what projection system it is and with the various WCS headers that tell you how to map sky coordinates to pixel coordinates. And again, the advantage of pixels is that you typically don't have to worry about what these different WCS keys mean. All of the functions in pixel are meant to uh, uh, kind of like uh, just encapsulate that information and abstract it away and then, and then you can get, for example, uh, this particular function in Pixel in the module nmap called box gives you the bounding box of a map that has a particular shape in WCS. And a, re and a recurring theme when you're using um, maps with Pixel uh, is this pair of properties, shape and WCS. Okay, so shape tells you, which what we just saw, how many pixels there are in each direction. So that's the shape of a NumPy array. And the WCS, the object that contains the information about mapping to between pixel and sky coordinates. And even if you don't have a map in hand, just these two objects, the shape, that's a tuple, and WCS, which is an AstroPy WCS object, those two things are enough to tell you most things about the map that don't have to do with the data in the map, right? So for example, if I knew the shape in WCS of some map, in this case, it's, a, it's the, the, those properties belong to this particular object that we just loaded, I can get the bounding box of that map, right? Um, 
So uh, the default units within pixel are in radians. So I can divide by degrees here. The, uh, so there's units in, in the uh, utilities module for pixel that let me convert between units. I can also convert between units by doing, for example, this numpy radians to degree or you know, multiplying by uh, 180 or pi, for example. Uh, so there's just three different ways of doing it. Once you do it, you'll, you'll see this box, bounding box uh, array that's returned. Um, and interpreting this requires you to remember a certain convention that Pixel uses for m many of these kind of box uh, 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 properties, uh, which is that uh, the bounding box has this convention. Uh, the first row is the, uh, the declination and uh, right ascension of one corner, and the, and the second row is the declination and right ascension of another corner. So in this case, this means that the map is, has a bounding box that goes from minus 10 degrees to one degree. So it's, it, it straddles the equator, and then it goes from 48 right ascension to 19 right ascension. You'll notice that it's going in the negative area direction because that's you know, how the sky looks when you're looking at the sky uh, from on it, right? So right ascension is going towards the left. Great, uh, so that's uh, one example of like a property of an app that you can get uh, by using SWCS information. Um, we, uh, you can go into the documentation and into the actual uh, code to, to look through the different uh, possibilities for all the kind of properties you can get about the map. Uh, but next, let's try and just plot this map. So to plot the map, um, the, you know, the obvious thing you can do with a two-dimensional image, which is what this array is, um, is to just use snapplotlet and say I am show. So when you do that, um, you get nothing. That's because snapplotlet didn't really learn the color scale very well. Um, uh, the map is in microkelvin units, and it has you know the same case fluctuations of around 300 microkelvin. So you can set those units to get uh, the uh, to see to see a map. So this is a real map of the CMB that's been made with uh, um, uh, that's, that's that's made from observations using ACT. And so you're looking at real data, and we're going to we're going to try and analyze this data. But the 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 the, the plot that's made by map plot doesn't look uh, that pretty because it's doing some interpolation and scaling. Um, so we're going to use an internal um, uh, plotting routine. So that's pixel uh, imp. It's nplot module uh, to plot uh, maps with nplot. The first thing you need to do is make a plots object, and you do that by saying nplot plot. plot. And there's various keywords that you can pass to it. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to pass the range, um, and we're going to set a value uh, which is zeros at the end edges of the map, where it's just going to mask it. Okay. So once the once the uh, uh, Plot object is made. You can either write it to a PNG file, which we'll see in a bit, or you can um, just show the map in line in, in Jupyter Notebook, right? So, so now that's that's much better. Uh, it's a really pretty map with the CMB, uh, and you can kind of really clearly see uh, the CMB uh, features, the hot and cold spots. Um, but if you wanted to zoom in to this map and just like poke around and look around it, it's not particularly useful to do it from a Jupyter notebook. So what you can do is uh, write this map to uh, a file. So to do that, you take the plots object and you pass it to the write function in, uh, in nplot. And you give it a file name, but you don't have to give it the extension uh, because it's always going to save a PNG file. And in general, the plots object can be made from a uh, map that isn't just a, uh, a two-dimensional array, but has leading dimensions, for example, that makes it a stack of maps, in which case it will just output and write all of those maps to disk. So what this cell is going to do is it's going to write the file to disk. Um, and then I'm going to use my favorite utility for looking at, at maps. Uh, uh, so this, this is a utility called FEA. Uh, FEH. Um, so it's available on most Linux uh, distributions. <laughs> if you know of uh, an equivalent uh, you know, software that's as, as nice to use, 
uh, on, on Macs, for example, raise it in the issue so that we can recommend it here. Um, but this is going to just save it to disk and load it up in Fed. Okay, so, so now you can see that this has popped up on the full screen and I can press arrow keys to zoom in and zoom out of the map. Uh, and I can pan around the map uh, with, uh, with the mouse by dragging it. Uh, and now I can really see these features, the cold, hot and cold spots. But you, can, you can also really interestingly see, uh, due to the extremely high resolution of the ACT uh, experiment, you can see point sources, right? So this is not something you see very obviously if you just opened up a plant map. Um, you can see lots and lots of point sources um, that, uh, that are there on the map. Um, and uh, so FAIR is nice because uh, you can also load up multiple images and then if they're the same footprint, then you can just flip between them and it will freeze the, the viewport, for example. Um, so that's a nice feature. Uh, and you can see that by default, Nplot has laid out a grid that's about a degree. Uh, it's, I think, exactly a degree. Uh, and it also has some axes here to show what the right ascension and declination are. So that's a really handy tool to have. Any questions so far? Uh, and has anyone figured out how I can clear the outputs from these cells? <laughs> Not, not me. <laughs> I'm just Don't you go to kernel and then restart and clear outputs? Ah, okay. That that's that's great. Restart and clear output. Perfect. That's going to require us to run everything again, but that's fine because everything's reasonably fast. Thanks for that, uh, Adri. That was you. Great. Okay, so so now we have the element of surprise. Uh, okay, so 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 far we've uh, learned how to load the map, inspect it, look at its shape in WCS, plot it, uh, and I've recommended a nice tool on, on Linux that you can use to to explore maps. Um, the next thing we're going to do to get uh, uh, a feel of how, how different functions in, in, in Pixel work is say your astronomer friend told you that there is uh, something interesting at a declination of minus 2.38 degrees and right ascension of 33.92 degrees. Um, let's say you wanted to go to that location uh, and, and look at it. Um, it's not so easy to just do it with Fe because, um, well, maybe it's a little bit easy, uh, easier than if you didn't have that, uh, you could just try and find the coordinates here and then, and then zoom into it. Um, but you can do something more direct with code, uh, which is uh, to just cut out a stamp uh, that's, located, that's centered around, around that location in the map. Um, to do that, you first need to uh, uh, define a bounding box, right? So uh, the information we need for the bounding box is A, the center, so that's the coordinates of the source that um, your friend told you. Um, and here's an important point, like all of the, the convention in all of Pixel is to store everything in radians uh, in the order declination first and then right ascension. So that follows the NumPy convention of having the y-axis in the first axis in the, in the first dimension and in the first dimension and the x-axis in the second dimension. Um, so declination and, and right ascension have to be converted to radians in, in this order. And then let's say that we wanted to get a stamp that's a width of 20 arc minutes. So that's 20 over 60 degrees, convert that to radians. So that's the width of the stamp that we want. Um, I showed you earlier that the convention for bonding boxes in Pixel is to have uh, the from corner first in the first row and the, and the uh, in the final corner in the, in the second uh, row. So we're just going to make a, a, a bounding box that has, uh, you know, starts at width over two to the left and uh, ends at width over two to the right uh, at, at, at the given declination and, 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 and right ascension. Okay, so once we have this bounding box, it's in radians. Um, we can then take the, so this is the ND map. This is the ACT map that's in, a, in an ND map object, which is a NumPy array that, is an ex, that has an extensions that block where it's WCS. Um, and unlike NumPy arrays, 
uh, it has all these additional uh, functions. So a submap is an example of a function that not by arrays don't have, but MD maps have. And that's a WCS aware uh, function. So I can call that member function uh, using the dot operator. So I want to get the submap of the I map. So this is, if you look through the documentation, you can see many of these different member functions that, that are WCS aware. And then I'll tell it the, um, uh, the bounding box. So if you just want to look at the doc string for that, uh, so this tells you that um, you can, this is a function that extracts the part of the map inside the given coordinate box. Uh, and it takes in uh, a, bo a bounding box array in radians. Uh, and this is a, it's a couple more uh, things you can pass in. Okay, so let's do that. Um, great. Okay, um, a point to note about many of these member functions is that almost all of them also exist. So if you, if you like to do things uh, not in the object oriented way, but in the functional programming kind of sense, then they also exist as functions that are just part of the module nmap. So nmap is the most commonly used module in pixel, and it also has a submap function. Uh, but instead of you know, dotting it from the object itself, you can pass the map whose submap you want as a first argument, and then pass the box as a second argument. So most of these member functions have equivalent uh, module-based um, uh, functions. And some of them don't actually need you to pass a re like a real map in, but just need, but you just need to pass in the shape in WCS, for example. We just know the geometry of map. You can do that. You can't, you can't obviously do that with the submap, because submap is a function that gives you a, a smaller map from, it extracts a map from a bigger map. Um, what this map does is it, it basically just converts the bounding box to pixel units and then slices the number array, right? So that's important. Um, and this is why, um, you know, a pixelization that's uh, like rectangular pixelization, for example, is really nice because you don't have to do any reprojection. Um, for example, if you wanted to do a similar operation with Helpix, then you'd have to do maybe like a mnemonic projection, reprojection uh, centered on, on, a, um, um, on a point source. Um, just because of the fact that the Helpix array is stored in, in memory as a one-dimensional array, and you need to, if you want to display a stamp somewhere, then you'll need to do some kind of a projection to a, to, to a two-dimensional dimension. But you don't need to do that with rectangular pixelation. You can just slice out a sub, uh, you know, just slice the numpy array and get and get, get a smaller stamp out of it. There you go. So that's uh, so uh, the astronomer friend was right. There is something interesting there. Uh, I guess mildly interesting for us because it's a point source beam shaped, um, and um, uh, okay. So let's see what else we can see with this stamp. So, so now that you've taken a sub map of, this, uh, of the uh, bigger map, you return the stamp uh, ND map, which is again an ND map that's an extension of a NumPy array, and you can see that it has uh, similar uh, properties as the as the bigger map. Um, it has a shape and it has a WCS, but the shape is now smaller because it's a submap, and the WCS is now different because it's uh, it's because it's a um, uh, different location in, in the sky. It doesn't have it doesn't have the same span as the original map. Um, I'll just note uh, an interesting point here is that uh, this WCS is in a very rigid sense. Uh, equivalent to the previous WCS. So this is a point that you'll uh, get used to once, you're, once you've used Pixel quite a bit, which is that um, uh, just like different pixel station, if you, if you change the pixel station, pixel size, for example, uh, then the WCS is no longer equivalent, right? Because you, if you want to go from one to another, you have to do some kind of interpolation. But this particular WCS is in a very uh, real sense, it's equivalent to the original WCS, which is that you can just, uh, if you start with a map that has this WCS, then you can always pad it with uh, an integer number of pixels to get back to the original WCS. And that's a nice property to have because if you wanna go from one geometry to another, you don't have to do any interpolation. You can just uh, you know, pad with zeros, for example, um, Okay, so that's just, a, that's just a subtle point that, that you'll become more familiar with later. Uh, but this, this, you don't, if you wanted to insert uh, a, 
uh, a stamp into the into the map at this point. For example, you don't need to do any interpolation because it's an, it's an, an equivalent WCS. Okay, um, so what this cell did was also to just uh, plot this uh, stamp with, instead of doing the map plot, let me plot it with n plot. And like the previous case, this is not really a, a, a you know, pretty plot. It's very tiny, it's really small. That's because what n plot does, it, it tries to avoid, um, I think it completely avoids any form of interpolation, upscaling, or averaging by default. So the actual source is uh, it's just 39 by 40 pixels wide. So that's what it's going to try and show on the screen. Um, so that's really small. So if you, if you wanted to use n plot to plot small things, you can try and upgrading the map. So instead of passing in the, 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 the stamp itself, I can upgrade. I can use an nmap function called upgrade to, uh, to increase the number of pixels by a factor of five. Um, and then you can kind of uh, you know, see something that's a little bit more similar to what Manuel Web shows. Okay, um, any questions so far from people on Zoom? All right, um, let's look at uh, a few more uh, nice functions that are in a pixel that lets you get, uh, try and let you extract uh, some meaningful information about, about this point source, for example. Um, if, for example, I wanted to ask the question, what's the average value of uh, all the pixels within a given radius compared to the average value of the pixels in, uh, you know, outside that radius, um, how would you go about doing that? Uh, so something that's really useful for doing that uh, is to get some physical information about the distances uh, of the uh, different pixels in this map from the center. Um, so uh, when you're doing source work, uh, a commonly used function for that is mod r map, which you can think of as modulus of r or distance. Um, so what that does is, again, it, it's a member function of the little stamp that you have. Um, it basically it first calculates the sky positions in declination and right ascension for each pixel, right? So it just, uh, so that's what, what the WCS information there is for. It, it takes each pixel and translates that, that, that into declination and right ascension for each pixel. And then um, in, uh, it does something a little bit more sophisticated to account for sky curvature, but in, for this particular case, you can just think of it as taking this, uh, the sum of squares of that, right? So it's calculating the distance from the center. Uh, so it's, it's differencing the declination right ascension from the center and then taking the sum of squares of that. Um, it, the function is about sky curvature, so, so it, it does something actually a little bit more sophisticated. Um, but for our purposes, purposes, it's just giving you the distance from the center and you can think of it as a Cartesian distance. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, this, this function also exists as a uh, function of the module rather than a member function of the, um, of the, of the ND map itself. So I get that function, um, then I can plot it and it looks like what you would expect it to be. It's got the uh, units of radians uh, from the center. So it's zero in the center and non-zero far away from it. It gets it's increasing as you, as you move away from the center. So why is this uh, nice? It's, it's nice because it's a it's another array. Uh, in fact, it might actually be a, uh, it might actually be an ND map itself. You can check that, although it's not. Yeah. So it, it's it's another array with the same shape in WCS as the original stamp itself, um, which means that you can use it to select regions in the stamp, right? So uh, if you're familiar with NumPy. Uh, you can use, uh, you can just kind of index the parts of this stamp that have, that have uh, a distance, which is mod r map, that's less than some radius. Okay, so the radius is two arc minutes, so we decided to just measure the mean, um, mean pixel value within a certain radius. Um, and, and we're just going to look at the mean pixel value outside that radius as well. Uh, so, you, so as long as this array is the same shape, which it is, because you just um, it's a map of the, of the distances, you can get these. Um, you can use it to slice the, the original stamp, and then you can get flux values. And, and, and as you can see here, the uh, the flux, or you know, it's not actually flux because it's not in the right units, 
um, but it's, it's 10 times larger than the, uh, the, the, the flux inside is 10 times larger than the flux outside. So it's clearly a point source there. You know, I don't need to tell you that because you can see it, but this is just to point out that you can use these kind of objects uh, to do quantitative analysis that, uh, um, with, with, with any maps. Um, and, and, and it's nice to know that you, know, you, you, did, you did all of this without ever having to think about things like the width of the pixel, right? Or, or you know, where it is, uh, or how to convert between a pixel index and, and, a, um, and a sky coordinate. So that's, 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 that's pixel's job. Okay, so um, here's a few other examples of how to, how to use uh, pixel for manipulating these maps. Um, previously, I used the box function to uh, extract a smaller map from a bigger map. Um, in order to do that, you needed to provide something in physical coordinates, um, which, you know, uh, for reasons uh, that you probably discover on your own, it's not nice to, uh, to always work with like uh, just you know, physical coordinates when you're trying to extract parts of the map because different people might round it in different ways. Pixel unifies the rounding, but you know, if you tell someone to extract something from this map at this particular, uh, with this particular bounding box and physical units, um, you know, if they're trying to do a precision analysis, they might round off differently and, and that it can cause confusion. Um, so if you wanted to, for example, just trim the edges of the map, I wouldn't try and do it with some physical coordinates. Uh, I would just say, I don't want the first 400. So let's say I didn't want the first 400 uh, pixels in the y direction, and I don't want the last 300. I don't want the first 900 in the right ascension direction, and I don't want the last 1200. You can use you know, all of the indexing tricks you're familiar with from NumPy uh, to do that. Um, and, and now we're back working with the big map, by the way. So this is not the stamp anymore, it's the big act map. Um, so I can slice it the way I would usually do it on my array. Uh, and then I can look at it. Uh, and then I'm gonna compare the shape in WCS of the map that I started out with and the shape in WCS of the map that I ended up with. Um, and the really neat thing is that, uh, again, you didn't have to say anything about WCS or sky coordinates or anything of that sort. When you do a NumPy operation uh, that involves some kind of indexing, the WCS object inside it will automatically adjust, right? Um, so you very rarely have to actually interact with the, the details of the WCS. Um, so you can see that the map, uh, because it trimmed the edges, it's become smaller, but the WCS information has also changed because it's a, it's, a, it's a different map. But to bring back an earlier point, this is still an equivalent to WCS. The second WCS is still equivalent to the first one because it's just related to the original one by um, padding of integer pixels. Okay, so I can plot the trimmed map. Um, where I'm going with this is that I want to extract a region of this map that's far away from noisy edges. And then I eventually want to filter it and calculate the sparse spectrum. So that's why I'm showing this in particular. I've sliced off, I've trimmed off the edges far away from the, uh, from the noisy edges. Um, and I plotted it and it looks uh, reasonably nice. Uh, it's very deep in the center and it gets noisier towards, towards the outside. Um, to make things faster, uh, I'm going to downgrade this map. Okay, so a, a few points are worth mentioning here. Uh, the reason I'm doing this downgrading is uh, just so that you know, things are smaller in memory. Uh, I'm not going to do any high precision with this map. Um, what this function does is, uh, so previously you, see, you, see, you saw the upgrade function that interpolates uh, when you're changing the uh, resolution by factor of five. The downgrade function averages pixels in blocks of four. Um, and, uh, and then you can look at the output again. So, so it's just a smaller map. Uh, it has a different shape in WCS. Um, again, to bring back an earlier point, this WCS is no longer equivalent to the previous WCS. Uh, you, ca you cannot go back to the original WCS uh, without interpolating in some, in, in some way. Um, okay, so, so now you have a downgraded map. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you're doing any kind of either pixel averaging or interpolation is that um, these operations don't necessarily 
uh, preserve the power in the map. If you do it the way that we've, we've just done it here, which is either interpolating for, for upgrading or pixel averaging for downgrading, it effectively introduces a pixel window function in the map. Um, so when you're doing precision analysis, you have to be careful about those things. You, you will change the power of the map, you'll even change the profiles of objects in the map. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, the last point I wanna make before I move on to things like filtering and parse spectra uh, is that it's, it's okay. So, so you have these objects that are MD maps that are extensions of NumPy arrays. Okay, so this is an important point. So sometimes you might do things with this map that are not functions that exist in pixel, but you know, functions that exist somewhere outside, maybe a NumPy function, for example. So you might wanna take, for example, so I just copied this map here, which is the downgraded map. And I'm gonna pass it through a function. It doesn't really matter what function this is, that's not important here. So I'm gonna pass it through the FFT shift function, which doesn't make any sense at all because this is not a Fourier transform. Um, but just as an example, I'm gonna pass it through a function, which unfortunately is going to completely clobber the WCS information. Right? So this original map had shape in WCS. Uh, and this new, and I'm gonna pass it through this function and usually when I pass something through, when I pass a NumPy array through what's called a universal function that acts on NumPy arrays, I can get back another NumPy array. But in our case, our array is not just a NumPy array, but it's an extension of a NumPy array called an MD map. And most functions in Pixel respect that. And if you pass it, in, uh, uh, if you pass it uh, uh, an MD map, it's gonna return an MD map. But there are some functions out there that are going to um, you know, internally it's gonna do something to the array like numpy dot as array or something like that, instead of doing numpy as any array. Uh, in those cases, what happens is that the map that comes out no longer has the WCS. So you sent in a map that had, was an ND map and had a WCS object, um, you get back a map uh, that's just a pure numpy array. It's just an ND array, it's not an ND map, it doesn't have WCS. Um, but that's okay because you probably have the original WCS somewhere. You might have it in the original map or maybe you save it elsewhere. If you lost the WCS information um, because you passed it to a function that's outside pixel, you can always attach it back. Okay, so you can take the map and I can, there's many different ways to do it. I can say uh, nmap.same WCS, which is just telling pixel, uh, I want to get back this map, nmap, uh, such that it has the same WCS as the, the map T map. Okay. Alternatively, I can also, let's say I, I had already saved the WCS somewhere else by accessing the WCS object like this. Then I can um, either use the ND map function or the N map function, they're pretty much equivalent to say, I want to attach this WCS object to the uh, NumPy array that lost its WCS. I can also use this to change the WCS of an existing NumPy array, although that's something you almost have, uh, you know, never have to do because uh, uh, you know, the WCS array is going to be tightly linked to the shape of the array itself. Uh, but in this case, you know, you, you just lost the original WCS, so you just want to attach it back, so you just kind of use one of these functions. And so now all of these functions give you back the original uh, array with, with the original WCS. So that's just a tip to keep in mind if you lost the WCS somewhere, you can attach it back. Okay, uh, so now we're getting close, closer to doing something uh, exciting with this map, which is we're gonna like filter it, uh, and we're gonna look at this parse vector. Um, so hopefully you'll have really looked at the tutorials that show you how to analyze maps with FFTs. And you probably learned there is that uh, if you want to take a Fourier transform of something, um, then it's meaningful when it has a periodic boundary condition because our map doesn't have uh, you know, so edges that are not periodic. Uh, we're going to force that periodicity by appetizing um, the map uh, or, or just constructing a new appetized taper. Okay, so there's a there's a uh, convenience function in nmap called uh, appod. Um, I'm going to pass it an array of ones, because uh, that tells me, so what this function actually does is it applies the operation to the input map, but I just want to, I just want to get back uh, 
a map that has the same shape in WCS as the original map, but that's ones everywhere in most places on the map, but that smoothly transitions to zero. So for this, we use something, uh, we use a cosine appellation that uh, transitions from one to zero uh, using a cosine function. Um, this function needs to know how many pixels this cosine function is going to appetize over. It's going to transition over 40 pixels from one to zero. Um, so that's what it's doing here. We've just uh, requested uh, you know, uh, cosine taper applied to a map that is all ones. So that gives me gives me this uh, appetize taper. I can apply this uh, taper to the CMB map whose Fourier transform I want to take. Um, and you can see that it smooths out the edges, uh, it, it zeroes out the edges smoothly. Uh, so it, it forces periodicity on one map. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to uh, start calculating Fourier transforms. Um, Pixel has the capability to do both two-dimensional Fourier transforms and spherical Hahn-like transforms. Uh, there are some situations, many situations, if you're working with ground-based experiments, where two-dimensional Fourier transforms are very useful. Um, this happens in particular because, for example, when you're making a map on the ground, the noise and systematics typically have a projection uh, that's natural in the 2D uh, Fourier system. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to mask out noisy modes in the horizontal or vertical direction, uh, it's very challenging to do that with a spherical harmonic uh, filter. Um, what, you, what you can do, however, is, is uh, Fourier transform into a Fourier space and then apply a, apply a filter there. Um, but also, uh, FFTs are just much faster. So, if you're working with a small patch, uh, which you might be, for example, if you're doing some kind of cluster work, um, and if either the, 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 the small patch has, is close to the equator and is not very wide or has been reprojected to a, to a visual station where it is close to the equator, then you can get away with doing Fourier transforms with no loss of accuracy and they're much faster. So it's useful to learn how to, how to do FFTs on, on, on maps. Um, okay, so to take an FFT, it's really simple. Um, there is an FFT module in Pixel, but those are uh, kind of lower level utilities. For 99% of the things you want to do with FFTs, you should be using the FFT function and the IFFT function and similar functions in the NMAP module of Pixel itself. Okay. Um, so the FFT is very simple. If you've already tapered the map, which is what you're doing here, uh, you, you're multiplying the, the map by the taper. Um, and one thing that we recently added to Pixel, I guess in the last six months, um, but it's not the default, but it's actually very useful to always have whenever you're doing a normalization time and you're doing an FFT, is to specify the normalization is physical. Um, what this means is that, uh, you know, this is, this is another one of those things that where Pixel helps you to do everything without thinking about things like the size of Pixel. Uh, usually if you take an FFT, uh, it does it in some units, where things are in pixel units. And uh, if you square that map, for example, if you square the FFT, you don't get the power spectrum of the map in units of stir radians, which is what you'd usually want when you're making a power spectrum plot. Um, if you wanted to do that conversion, if you didn't pass the normalization physical argument, the default normalization is not going to apply these, uh, these normalization factors that depend on the pixel area. Uh, in which case, if you wanted to square the Fourier transform and calculate its power spectrum, you would have to think about the pixel area of the map. Uh, so uh, to avoid that, you can just always get into the habit of, of saying that you want a physical normalization. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that if you choose a certain normalization, either the default one, which means you're not speci specifying anything for the normalization, or if you choose the physical normalization. Um, if you want to come back to real space and by doing an inverse Fourier transform, then you should apply the same normalization. Okay, that's the only thing to keep in mind. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're annoyed by the fact that you have to always type, uh, you, have, you always have to type this 
out, then somewhere in the top of your script, you can just have something like, you know, like this. I right, suggest so you can forget about it and then start taking Fourier transforms without the normalization. But you'd have to do the same thing for the inverse Fourier transform as well. So that just ensures that your script has the same normalization for FPs and, 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 and inverse Fourier transforms. Okay, um, so let's see what this Fourier transform looks like. We're doing it in physical normalization, so we can use it for a Fourier transform later. Um, you'll find that. So it's already taken the Fourier transform of this map. Um, that was decently fast because it's a uh, it's a it's a um, uh, reasonably small array. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that the FFT module. So this is using um, uh, so it's using a module from a pixel called the FFT module. Um, if you go to this module, you you will see that. Um, See, so let me just import this module just to show you. If you're wor worried about performance, for example, if you want to speed up your FFTs, then you can check what engine it's using. Okay, uh, so what this is telling me is that it's using the NumPy library to calculate Fourier transforms. Um, and this is actually useful information for me to know right now because it means that I haven't installed the pi FFTW uh, FFT uh, library. So if you install this FFT, pi FFTW library, uh, you get much faster FFTs. Um, the nice thing about Pixel is that you don't have to worry about this. Uh, if you've already installed it, then pixel.fft is going to load the faster library. It's going to load, it's going to try and look for pi FFTW first. If it doesn't find it, it's going to use NumPy. In this case, I can just print what the engine is and it tells me that I'm using NumPy, so it tells me that I should really be installing Pi FFTW to make my FFTs faster. That's just a tip. Okay, so um, you can see this FFT function uh, returns a new array that has the same shape in WCS as the original array, uh, but it's a complex array now, right? So if I print it, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a complex FFT, so it's, it's going to be, it's going to have both a real and imaginary part. So what can I do with this? Um, in order to do stuff with the FFT, uh, just, just like you need to be able to convert from sky coordinates to pixel coordinates in order to, in order to do stuff with a map in real space, you need to be able to convert from um, the pixel Fourier transform Fourier frequency units to physical Fourier, Fourier frequency units. So the L's that you're used to in, uh, in, in CMB analysis, uh, the multipole space, but in this particular case, it's an approximation, flat, the flat sky approximation where it's using 2D FFTs. Um, I can get a map of what the different Fourier frequencies in each. So this returns a Fourier transform where each pixel is a Fourier pixel. So it's a new space, it's a, a two-dimensional Fourier space. And if I wanted to know what the Fourier frequencies in the Y direction and the X direction, in general, they're gonna be different because the map has different dimensions in X and Y. I can get a map uh, that tells me what the Fourier frequency in the Y direction in this particular case is for each pixel. So you can see that it's the same along the rows. Um, and I can get it similarly for the uh, for the x direction. If you're uh, if you're familiar with working with FFTs, you remember that the convention is to have um, positive frequencies starting with zero first, and then increasing negative frequencies. Um, so so that's that's fine as, as you know as long as all of these uh, uh, all of these functions are consistent in, in the way they're using the frequencies. That's totally fine. But it's it's more intuitive to see it in in the shifted space. So you might have done this before with FFTs. Uh, we shift the frequencies such that it's the zero is centered. Um, so now you can see the zero is in the middle here. Um, I wanna, again, another tip is that uh, if you're plotting quantities that are in Fourier space, then you typically only want a Fourier, you only wanna shift the Fourier frequencies right before plotting. I would not recommend that you uh, 
actually shift each and every Fourier frequency object that uh, you know area that, that's being returned by uh, by um, pixel because that's going to be confusing and that's going to be a lot of FT shift operations. Um, as long as all the functions are using the same FMT frequency uh, convention, this is totally fine. So that's going to be the case with model map as well. So similar to having distances from the center in real space, we can have Fourier frequency magnitudes uh, as a distance from the center. So again, I'm going to plot model map which is a modulus of the, the absolute value of the Fourier frequency as a, uh, uh, its distance from the central frequency, which is zero, which is the mean of the map. And I'm going to plot it in a, uh, after FT shifting it. So this model map object is going to be something that you use a lot, especially if you're going to do isotropic operations. So if you're going to apply filters or bin power spectra isotropically, then you're going to know and love model map a lot because you're just going to be using a lot because uh, that's a core um, object. So it's an array that has it's a map that has the same shape as the full map, but it gives you uh, the magnitudes of the Fourier frequencies in each Fourier pixel. Now I can use this to build a simple isotropic filter. Okay, say that I wanted to build a, um, a really poor point source finder, like a really unsophisticated point source finder. Um, what I'd want to do is I'd want to go to Fourier space and downweight the large scales because it's going to be dominated by C and D. Um, and I want to downweight the small, very small scales because it's going to be dominated by instrument noise. Um, and I can pick, I can try and pick a sweet spot, which is around 45, 100L, let's say for the, for the noise here. Um, and I'm going to construct a Gaussian that's just Gaussian one dimensional filter that's just centered around 4500 with a width of 500. Um, so this is what the filter looks like in one dimension. So it's uh, the, the value of the filter in the y direction and the um, absolute value of the Fourier frequency in the X direction. Okay, um, but I want to apply this to a 2D map, right? So, and I want to use this as an isotropic filter, which means that I need to make a two-dimensional filter that has uh, basically uh, you know, its maximum magnitude at, at a, in a ring that's centered around L4500. So you can do that very simply by uh, taking this one dimensional uh, filter and then interpolating that onto a grid. So what this is saying that um, I'm going to build a one dimensional interpolation the, for each Fourier pixel in this map. Um, that tells me what the absolute value of the magnitude is. Um, so I evaluate this interpolated function at those values um, and that returns a two dimensional function that's going to be isotropic. Uh, so that's just the two-dimensional equivalent of this isotropic filter. It's a ring centered on our 4500, the width of 500. You could um, also evaluate uh, the expression earlier directly on the model map. Yes, you totally can, absolutely. But then that wouldn't show you uh, what it looks like in one dimension. But that's totally true. Yeah, Thanks. I just show that you can do arbitrary math operations and chains of them with the end maps and get an end yeah. map out in the end. Yeah, and I, I also just wanted to show that you know, usually how uh, you're going to start out with some filter that's in one dimension, and it's useful to know how to interpolate that into two dimensions, right? So that's yeah. Uh, yeah. great. Um, oh, uh, for for those of you around, Sigurd Ness wrote ninety nine percent of this library, uh, so he's uh, he's who we should thank for this. Okay, great. Uh, so we're going to take this Fourier transform of, uh, of the map and we're going to multiply it by this two-dimensional filter that we just, we just made. Um, so that's literally the operation of filtering, which is to Fourier transform the map, multiply it with the two-dimensional filter. Um, and if you and then want to look at the filtered map in real space, you have to inverse Fourier transform that map. Remember, you apply the same normalization that you applied for the Fourier transform which is the physical normalization. Uh, and again, if you didn't have this argument here, then you shouldn't have had this argument here. As long as you use the same normalization, it doesn't matter. And once you've taken the uh, inverse Fourier transform, you take its real part, uh, and then you can plot that first. And there you go. So you can see that it's a really poor 
point source finder. Uh, it's looking for things that objects that have some physical scale that corresponds to our 4500, which is a few arc minutes. And that turns out to be those point sources that we saw earlier in the tutorial, right? So there's, uh, these could be point sources, they could be clusters, anything that's roughly beam shaped. Uh, it's a few arc minutes wide. Um, the proper way to do this is obviously with a mask filter, uh, but that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. I just wanted to show you how you can apply a filter and look at, look at uh, filtered maps. Okay, so uh, the next thing we want to do is actually calculate the power spectrum of this original map. So we have this nice apodized tapered map here, um, and we want to calculate its power spectrum and then compare it to theory. Uh, because this is a CMB map, you expect it to have features that look like the CMB. Um, so for that, you don't need to, you, in this particular case, you're not gonna use the filtered map, you're gonna use the original Fourier transform. The auto power spectrum of a map is just the, the basically the square of, of the Fourier transform. So that's the um, Fourier transform times its conjugate, and then you take its real part. And then you're gonna plot this power spectrum. Uh, and again, whenever you plot something in Fourier space, you want to you want to FFT shift it um, to center the zero frequency. Okay, so what you're seeing here uh, is so you can you can you can plot this either with um, matplotlib. Um, so either of these works, um, and you can see that there's a lot of power in the middle and in, in the center, which is close to zero frequency. So it's a, it's a red power spectrum. Remember, I've log transformed this. So that means this power spectrum is really rapidly falling. falling. Um, and it looks fairly isotropic. Um, so uh, that's what you would expect from things like the CMB, which is isotropic on the sky. Uh, you know, some part of the instrument noise is isotropic, most of the extra, uh, the extra galactic foregrounds are all isotropic. Um, but in general, you don't expect this power spectrum to be isotropic. You might, uh, you might see two-dimensional structure. Some of the reasons where you can see two-dimensional structure, if it's not a very deep map, then you're going to be, um, you're going to see instrument noises and isotropic near the center. You might have galactic foregrounds if there's a, if there's a blob, you know, of, of foregrounds or a string of foregrounds somewhere on the map, then it's going to be an isotropic. Um, and at very large scales, you might have things like down pickup, which, which can cause the, the, the 2D power spectrum to look an isotropic. But this one looks fairly isotropic, which means that uh, to compare this to theory, you want to transform this into uh, to a one-dimensional um, power spectrum. Um, and that means you want to average this power spectrum in annular bins. Okay, so uh, I've written a simple binning function here that just takes in a numpy uh, array and given the distances from the center and the bin edges, it calculates the average uh, 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 by just by histogramming the, the stuff that's within a, within a certain uh, annulus. It just, it just calculates what the average power spectrum within a certain annulus. Um, so we're going to do that and we're going to plot it against uh, theory eventually. So now you're looking at the the binned naive power spectrum of this patch of the sky that's been apodized. Um, and you can kind of see some wiggles here. So I plotted this as a function of L in DL space where I multiplied by, by, the, um, by L square. Um, so it looks like the noise, it, it looks like the power spectrum eventually becomes white at, on, on small scales. Um, so this is an L square plot, so it looks, it looks approximately white here. Um, but on large and intermediate scales, it looks very red. And you can see hints of acoustic oscillations. Uh, so just pause to take that in, right? You're taking real data from, from a CMB experiment uh, that looks at the sky, maps the mi microwave sky, uh, and you're seeing acoustic oscillations um, from, from the other universe uh, in this data. So that's really cool. Okay, but um, does this match your theoretical expectation? So to do that, uh, you can uh, use some of the utilities in the power spectrum uh, POWSPC module in Pixel. 
that has some functions that let you read in uh, data files that are in the CAM Boltzmann code output format. So, uh, so we have a, uh, a theoretical fiber visual power spectrum that's just in the same directory that you can just load in, and then you can plot it against the um, you can plot it against the data that you just collected. And it looks pretty different. So there's many reasons why this is different. Um, uh, the, the one that I won't go into is that, of course, you have a beam in this experiment, uh, and, and we haven't decomposed the beam. Um, and of course, this, this is an auto spectrum, uh, so you have noise on, on small scales. So when you square noise, you're gonna get a noise bias. So this is why this is just a diagnostic power spectrum. It's not a proper way of calculating a power spectrum. Um, but the interesting reason I want to spend a little bit of time on, on why this power spectrum in general is low is because you've applied uh, a taper, right? So what that means is that if you go back to this map, you've, um, in order to take a Fourier transform and make it periodic, you've essentially zeroed out a fraction of the map. So some fraction of this map has zero power. Um, which means that if you calculate the power spectrum of the map, you're going to get a biased value that's low by some fraction. You can uh, get a simple approximation for that, for what that, uh, for what that is, by just noting that what the power spectrum effectively does is to kind of square the map. So if I have a map uh, which is a taper that has zeros in some part of the in, in some fraction of the sky, then approximately the mean of the square of that map gives me roughly the scaling correction that I need to divide by in order to bring the power back to the, to the original value. Um, now you should note that the proper way of doing this is that uh, the mass doesn't just uh, reduce the power spectrum on average, it also couples different modes because you're applying an operation in, in real space which couples modes in, in further space. Um, so what you would really have to do to do this properly is to calculate, uh, given knowledge of the mask, what that coupling matrix between the different modes is, and then invert that matrix and deconvolve it, which is what the master algorithm does. And so you have codes like NAND master, PSPY, and PDES that are designed to do this properly. This is not in pixel. If you care about precision and analysis, that's what you need to do. But if you just wanted to have quick looks at the map and you just wanted to just make roughly, uh, you know, roughly be sure that the, uh, this is a reasonable map, then you can just plot this with a correction. That's a lot better, right? So the amplitude uh, agrees a lot better. You can still see the effect of the suppression of the beam, which we haven't taken involved here, and it's even noise. Um, but but on, on, on large scales where the beam is important, you can clearly see these acoustical oscillations in a map that you just downloaded from public data, which is, which is really neat. Okay, uh, so it's 1015. Um, the, the remaining things I wanted to talk about are uh, spherical harmonic analysis, which I'll do later at this time. Uh, but but I, I do want to talk a little bit about how you're going to interact with maps uh, that are in a different pixel station, uh, like the Planck maps, the W map maps uh, that are in the Hilbig pixel station. And in particular, you might be interested in uh, doing joint analysis of these maps. You might be interested in cross-correlating the Planck map with the ACT map, which we're going to do. Um, and if, if you have time, we'll also look at stacking, which we'll look at before so I like analysis. Any questions so far? Are there special sure. methods for dealing with uh, polarized maps? Yes, uh, totally. Uh, if you if you wanted to take, yeah, a, a really important thing that I should add to the next version of this tutorial is that many functions in Pixel are polarization aware, which means that uh, in particular, if you uh, if you pass fun to functions that, that know about polarization, then it thinks of the, so you can have NumPy array that has shape, like let's say 100, 100, but if it has a shape of, if it has a leading dimension of three, uh, many functions in Pixel will assume that it is an IQU map. Um, and for example, if you uh, uh, use the nmap.map to harmonics function on a map that has that shape, which has a shape of 300, 100, it's going to assume that the first component of this is an I is an intensity map, the second is a Q map, the third is a U map, 
and then do the polarization and rotation that's necessary to transform this into Fourier transforms that give you Fourier transforms of temperature, E mode polarization, and E mode polarization. Um, and similarly, when we get if we, if we get a spherical harmonics, uh, the same holds for things like uh, curved sky dot map to eight lamp, just like you'll buy you'll buy this. Great. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, to interact with maps that are uh, in a different pixel station, um, for example, in Helpix, there are many different ways to go from one pixel station to another. Uh, one that we use a lot and works really well for going from Plonk Helpix maps to ACT maps is to essentially just do a spherical harmonic transform of the Helpix map to ALMs. Uh, so that's going to uh, use, you know, uh, lip sharp underneath uh, on a Helpix station to get the ELMs. And then you can use inverse spherical harmonic transforms on the ELMs to the rectangular pixel geometry. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this is a, a straightforward way of going from one pixel station to another such that it exactly preserves the power in the map up to some scale. Uh, so it's a very safe way of doing it. Uh, if you if you if you care if you care about um, uh, if you care about preserving the power, and there are uh, several of these utilities in the reproject module of Pixel. Um, so one of them is the nmap from Helpix. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but like nmap is an equivalent name to ndmap. You can just use it in turn interchangeably. This function gets you an nmap or ndmap from a Helpix map. So you provide a plonk file name. Um, and then the, the, the next thing that you need to specify is this thing that I mentioned earlier that's you know, often something that you use as a pair in Pixel, which is the shape and WCS, the geometry that you want to, that you want to uh, reproject this map onto. In this particular case, we're interested in cross-collating the Plonk map with, uh, with the ACT map. Uh, so you want the Plonk map to go to ALMs and then inverse spherical harmonic transform it, transform it into the same pixelization as the Aphrodite taper map, which is S map. Uh, and then you can pass some additional arguments that tell it that there's only one component, you know, which fits header it's in the maximum L max you want to go to, you typically want to use something like three times N side or two times N side. Um, and importantly, you want it to rotate the coordinate system from galactic coordinates to equatorial coordinates, because you're working with the equatorial coordinates in the, um, in the ACT map. So I'll just get that going. So that takes a, a little bit of time, depending on how fast you can do spherical harmonic transforms on your computer. Um, so it's going to uh, it's 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 going to reproject, and then it's also going to do a rotation of the coordinate system in the middle. Uh, so this is a Plonk file that's already been downloaded. Okay, so it's done, uh, and then I can plot the map. There you go. So why don't we just use Fe to look at this uh, a little bit closer? In fact, uh, we might want to do something like compare it uh, next to each other. So plonk map. So it's written the map to disk, and I'm just going to go to the directory. Um, Okay, so nope, that's not what I want. So I would I would want to I, I want to save both the uh, plant map and the act map in the same directory, so I can flip between them with uh, with a page, which is a fun thing to do always. Uh, so this is going to be the original Aphrodite taper map. So I've written that. Um, so I'm going to pass this to Faye. Uh, so I'm, I'm passing both of these PNG files as an argument. Uh, and I set things up, well, this is a pretty low resolution. Uh, that's sad because I've downgraded these maps. 
but I can freeze the viewport and I can flip between the maps. Um, so what you can see uh, is that you reprojected these to the same area of sky. Uh, you can see a really good correspondence between the red spots and the core and the core spots. You're looking at a high resolution act map in a small deep patch of the sky and a, a lower resolution font map in the same patch of sky. And what's neat is that you can also see you know, really bright point sources in Planck that uh, appear in the same location as the act. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to point this out that it's, it's really nice to uh, have a utility like Faye that where you can just pass in a bunch of maps and freeze the viewport and flip through them and look at correspondence. So that's something that's very useful for visualization. Um, now that we know that these maps are in the same region, uh, we expect them to cross correlate, right? So we saw correspondence by eye, so we expect them to cross correlate. Which, and, and the, you know, the, the proper way to take a cross correlation is to take a for, yeah, Fourier transform of both maps. So in this case, I'm going to take the Planck map, I'm going to multiply it by the same taper, um, and then convert it to micro Kelvin units because it's by default in Kelvin. Apply the same normalization. And this time I'm cal calculating a cross power spectrum, which means I'm going to not square a particular Fourier transform map, but cross, like I'm going to take the product of the two Fourier transforms so that they did two different maps. Uh, I'm going to say, apply the same W2 correction that we saw earlier. Um, and I'm going to bin it with the bin initialize all. Okay, so that's uh, cool, right? So the blue points are the uh, is the auto spectrum of the act map that we saw earlier. The orange points are the cross correlation. So you're looking for the correlation between the font map and the act map, uh, and you can see really good correspondence on on very large scales. Uh, it's not going to be perfect correspondence because there's a small amount of noise bias on these large scales, the beams are slightly different, et cetera. But, um, and of course you haven't done the proper mode complete coupling calculation that we need to do. Um, but on large scales, yeah, you're seeing the same modes that Planck saw and you can verify that quantitatively with a, with a cross bar spectrum. Um, you can see that the orange points and the blue points are very different on, on uh, on small, on, on intermediate and small scales. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One is that the cross bar spectrum doesn't have a noise bias. So this is just fluctuating around zero because the noise in Planck and ACT are not correlated. And the other is that Planck and ACT have a different beam. Uh, so here you've seen the ACT beam squared, here you're seeing the ACT beam times the Planck beam. You haven't made an effort to decompose the beams. Okay, uh, cool. Any questions on that so far? I'm just going to check the Slack messages here. That's good. All right. The next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to write some code to get uh, a stack. I'm just checking the Zoom chat to see any messages. I see some people suggested stuff for clearing the outputs. That's helpful. Okay, let's continue. All right, so what we're gonna do is, um, so we have this act map, that's a CMB. Uh, right, so you have an act map, and also have the catalog of clusters. These are thermal SD clusters. Uh, Let me actually do this section first because this is going to let us flip through the bottom of the clusters and find the full stack. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a, a, a function, a really nice function that Sigurd recently wrote. Uh, Matt, your, your voice quality has, has dropped a bit. Oh, um, I'm not sure if you've moved. I have not moved and I'm wearing a microphone, so that's, it could be because. Maybe the microphone battery died, let me just check. Maybe the microphone moved on your clothes or something? There were some clicking sounds before the sound quality fell as if somebody had moved the, the microphone. Uh, yeah, it might be that the battery is low. No, no, somebody unmuted, so that's what happened. Oh, is it, is it better now? 
Yeah, it's fine now. Oh, great. Okay, so I'm just unmuting. Cool. Okay, uh, before we go to stack on actual clusters, um, the, I'm just going to show you a function that uh, allows you to make a mask uh, from a list of sources. Um, so what we have here is, uh, so I'm going to first load. Ah, okay, so we have an error. That's not good. Uh, so it's not opening the spits file. Possibly because. I had to go back and double you get that file again for the same error. Interesting. Wonder what happened. Uh, let's see why. Download problem, maybe? Yeah, but I had already downloaded. Uh, I guess I didn't download this previously. It's just a different laptop. Uh, Act 4 2016 lensing. Is that the right place for this catalog to be in? I guess it is. Uh, that's just weird that the Lambda link has lensing in it for a cluster catalog. Should check on that program later. Anyway, um, okay, so this catalog is probably fine now. No, it's not fine. Hmm. You'll have to delete the old one. Yeah. Okay, uh, but it's an HTML file now. Yeah, I guess that didn't work out of the box. Sorry about that. Okay, great. So now we have a catalog of uh, right ascension and declination of uh, clusters. Before we stack on this, uh, I'm just going to use this mask function that Sigurd recently wrote. Um, that basically, uh, given uh, the shape and WCS of the map, uh, it calculates a distance from source from a given list of locations. Okay, so it's uh, uh, the list of locations is this catalog that's been converted to radians, and I want to find all points that are. Uh, at a radius that are greater than that's greater than five walk minutes from the the list of locations that's in here. So it's a really neat function because what that means is that if it if it gives me that distance as a map, then I can just do a boolean operation on it to say that I want all distances that are greater than r, which is the distance that I want to mask at, and that will um, write uh, yeah, that will that will make a mask where it's ones uh, where there are no, where it's ones everywhere else, but zeros where there are, where there are objects. So that's a nice way to just plot objects, for example. Um, okay, so what I've done here is I've also plotted the actual map and the mask next to each other. Um, and I've only downgraded by a factor of two, so this should be a prettier uh, plot, plot hopefully, hopefully. So I'm going to use fair again on it. Okay, uh, so it's not the best color scale for this comparison, but this is the original map and this is the mask. Okay, so um, Matt Hilton and others have run cluster finder on the, on the, on the, on the full catalog, on the full uh, set of maps. So you can see that these clusters were found not just in the deep six region, but also in regions that are slightly outside of because you also had observations in, in, in the deep by six region, which is a larger area that's outside. But you can see that this Clustering of clusters here, not necessarily because of clustering clusters, but because it's, it's a deeper map and there's more, uh, we have better selection here. Um, so let's see if we can actually find one of these thermal SE clusters. So in, at 150 gigahertz, uh, the thermal SE effect causes a negative decrement. Uh, so can you spot any bright negative decrements uh, where these mask locations? I can see one here, for example. It's probably not the best one. So this location here. Matt says there's a cluster there, and you can kind of see a little bit of decrement. It's not the best color scale for this. Uh, I think there's a much brighter one here that I just found by eye without having to look at the mask. That cluster over here, you can see a slight negative decrement there. So, you know, there's a very good correspondence between this catalog and the negative decrements because that's how cluster finder works. It looks for um, SC profile shaped negative decrements at 150 gigahertz. 
Okay, so that's yeah, the only uh, problem with color scales. I almost always specify the color range myself, so I know how to interpret the scale. Yeah, that, I mean, by default, it has something that's always better than not color. But um, let's see, what range do we use here? 300, 200? Uh, no, I, I would do 500 probably. Well, seems like it worked. <laughs> Yeah, that's reasonably good. Um, yeah, that's a lot better, right? You can see a big cluster here. Sure. Okay, great. So um, we know this catalog is, uh, you know, mapping onto clusters. Uh, what if I was interested in doing source work um, uh, or cluster work? And if I wanted to get a stack on different locations, so just the average. Uh, Locate uh, the average uh, value of the uh, pixels around all these clusters. Uh, so we have to write some code for that. So so let's let's say that you have n clusters in, um, in this location. So any of those? Well, it's not too large a number. Um, if you go to any one of these clusters, you know, as we just saw, it's not very really bright. So you can try and stack over them. We're going to do a for loop. Now, you could uh, do the submap technique that I showed earlier, where you go and slice out a, a map without any interpolation. Um, but in general, that's not what we would recommend because you're, um, so while slicing out stuff is very nice and intuitive, uh, it's not the exact right operation to do when you're stacking. Uh, because this is a you know this is a pixelization of the sky. Uh, there's going to be distortions in any pixelization. So uh, in this particular cylindrical projection, you're going to get point sources that look like pancakes if you just slice out an area around them. Um, so that's why we have tools in the reproject module that let you take out postage stamps. So let's just look at the doc string for that. So what that does is it. Uh, it looks at it. It, take, it first takes out a slice around the around the map uh, at that at the location of a given uh, object. It takes the full map in. It, it looks at uh, it takes a cutout around it, and then it reprojects it to this mnemonic projection, which is a tangent plane projection, um, which means it effectively interpolates and then brings all of these objects into roughly the same coordinate system that's centered uh, at the center of the object. Okay, so that's a tangent plane projection. Um, and as with any of these interpolation operations, there's going to be some effective pixel window function that could, you know, at the, depending on the level of signal to noise that you have in your stack, it could change the effective profile. So you have to be careful about that and you have to test that. Usually you want to interpolate to a slightly higher resolution and then downgrade in order to make sure that you don't have this pixel window function. Um, we're not going to go into those details. We're just going to uh, cut out these stamps and then stack them. Uh, so I'm going to take a stamp, this equal to reproject of stamp. Uh, I'm going to do this with the small map, the, the, um, so that I don't go to the edges, the noisy edges. Um, and I'm going to pass it the right ascension and the declinations in degrees. So this is one of the rare places in Pixel where the right ascension and declination are in degrees instead of, instead of radians. In most other you know, modules, it's going to be in, in radians. I'm going to say I want a stamp that's, uh, let's say, uh, 20 arc minutes wide uh, at a resolution of 0.5 arc minutes. As I just mentioned, you know, typically you want to up upgrade, you want to interpolate into a higher resolution and then downgrade to wider, to, and then Fourier downgrade in order to avoid a um, pixel window function. That'll be in a separate tutorial maybe, but right now it's just the appro approximate thing of, 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 taking a, of putting it on a 0.5 arc minute pixel station. Okay, uh, and we're going to stack it. So that means you're going to uh, accumulate these values. <coughs> um, take its average. Um, error. OK, 
Okay, uh, let's look at this. Let's just debug this. Let's back off shape. It might also be that. So if the stamp is not found in the map, uh, then it's going to return none. So you want to avoid stacking nuns. Hmm. Shouldn't you pull just one of the coordinates from the RA's index? Or oh, passing yeah. the full vector? Thanks, I know that's exactly what it was. It doesn't work on an array. Uh, okay, so uh, that looks through the different uh, RA deck locations, uh, extracts the stamp, and then stacks it. So this was, let's look at the stack. Um, well, it's going to be a small stamp. Let me just use half on level. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's okay. So this particular function is uh, also a bare polarization. Um, so if the, the maps, if the input map was an IQU map, for example, it would do the proper polarization rotation necessary to account for sky curvature. So that's why if we're turning this, uh, uh, the stack is actually, uh, uh, the stamp uh, shape is an extra dimension because it's, uh, uh, yes, it's the last one is none, but it's, it's got an extra dimension. So let's only take the first uh, element, which is the only, the only one. Um, that only works if you don't pass in none. So let's do this here. That should be good. That's a pop to the array, and there you go. So you've gone to a location of all the clusters that are in this region, um, in this deep six map. Uh, and while you couldn't necessarily confirm that all those were clusters by eye by looking at it because you're not using a proper cluster finder, then you stack on it by reprojecting each cut out around it to a tangent plane projection and then averaging, uh, you can uh, clearly see the signal as a very high signal to noise. You can see a, a nice negative decrement that corresponds to the thermal SC from the oxy clusters. Um, and then you can use you know, the MODAR map and all those things we learned earlier to, um, uh, to take, for example, profiles and, and, and make physical inferences about, about these objects. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show for stacking. Uh, and I kind of covered masking. And so there's some time left over, I guess 20 minutes to talk about either spherical harmonic analysis or just generally take questions and, you know, does Pixel do this uh, kind of questions from people if you have to get questions. Okay, so uh, since there's no question, but feel free to chime in at that point. The um, thing that I just wanted to show next is, uh, so we've done some uh, approximate power spectrum calculations here that use Fourier transforms. If you had a much larger patch of the sky, uh, then you would want to use spherical harmonic transforms. Um, so Pixel has a module called Cloud Sky, which as a set of functions that interface with the libsharp library. And so this is the same library that's used by Kilpix uh, underneath to calculate spherical harmonic transforms. Um, and libsharp is very nice because it, it supports all kinds of different pixel stations for converting from, uh, from real space to spherical harmonic space. Um, and the stuff here, so I'm also gonna import Kilpy here because once you get ELMs, you want to use some HealPy functions to go for the CLs. Uh, okay, so curve sky is installed. Um, this is one of those parts of Pixel that require compiling. Uh, so if you can't import it right now, don't worry, you can try and fix the, uh, the, the installation issues later. Um, okay, so let's see what we can do with this. Let's, um, 
why don't we take, uh, we can do the simple exercise of taking this appetized map, uh, which is again on, on a small region of the sky. Um, and then we're going to calc instead of calculating its Fourier transform, we're going to calculate its spherical harmonic transform. Um, and the, one of the nice things about pixel uh, or you know uh, rectangular pixelations is that you can very easily just calculate spherical harmonic transforms on patches of the sky instead of on instead of the whole sky. So you don't have to do a calculation on the entire sky. I think it effectively still does it in the in the same declination ring as the, as the patch, but it's still a, a huge amount of savings in terms of time. Um, so let's take S map and then calculate this. It's quite a online as well. Uh, and really the only thing I need to pass to this is the L max. So let's say that we want to go out of 6,000. Um, and that should give me LMs. So the, the interface for this is um, somewhat similar to Hitiko, but not exactly. Um, so we should be careful about that. Okay. Ah, okay. So in this case, uh, it's complaining that it's not a cylindrical layout because it's a CEA map. Uh, okay, so maybe we should reproject this to CAR to see if that works. So <clears throat> CEA is a cylindrical layout, so it's a bit weird yeah. that we're getting uh, that error message. But um, the thing with C with LibSharp is that um, to do map to ALM, you need the uh, ring weights, and uh, LibSharp only comes with the uh, ring weights for a limited number of pixelizations. Those pixelizations are basically heel picks, three variants of CAR, and a pixelization that nobody uses called Gauss Legendre pixelization. So CEA map to ALM is not directly supported by LibSharp. So that's probably the real problem that's occurring here. Okay, uh, so that's it's complaining with the wrong error message. So why don't we? Uh, so since the you know, all the future releases of ACT are going to be in the CAR projection. Why don't we uh, reproject this map for now to, so that shows you an extra step of how to reproject this map to CAR projection. What I'm going to do is, okay, so this function lets you uh, create a new geometry. Okay, so a new shape of the CS pair that uh, that you can then specify with the bonding box. So I can take smap, say smap dot box. Uh, so the position of this geometry is gonna be the bonding box of the original map. Um, and the resolution is going to be Point five arc minutes, and the projection is going to be CAR. Okay, good. Uh, so typically, you need to be careful about how you do this, but in this case, you can project. Uh, we're going to interpolate the original map onto the onto the onto the new geometry. So you can take the original map that's in CA projection, and then we are going to project it onto this new, new geometry and we're going to use, let's say, order equals three interpolation. But that again introduces a bit of a pixel window function. We're not going to worry about it right now. Uh, so the new projected map is going to be P map. Okay, so that works. That was reasonably fast. Uh, there we go. And now you should be able to, since there's ring weights for CAR, you should be able to calculate the map to go for this. Yep. Okay. Uh, good. So now you have ALMs. Um, and they're complex. And you want to square them. So 
the ALMs are going to be you know, in the look sharp format, which means you can use seal by functions on them to go from an ALM to CLs. Okay, so let's plot this against what we had earlier. Uh, and we're not going to get perfect agreement again because we have to think about our good old friend, the W factors that, uh, that tell you, oops, I've overwritten one of these variables, ls. So let me just make that again. Okay, plot this here. Well, it's gonna be pretty noisy uh, and it has the wrong W factor. Okay, so uh, the W factor, so this is, again, this is because you've calculated uh, the spherical normal transform on a fraction of the sky and the rest of the sky is masked. So you have to apply uh, a W factor for that. Um, let's try and think of what that might be. Um, a taper. But I think this needs to be divided by the area of the sky. So I always need to think about this a little bit before. The correction factor should simply be the effective sky fraction of, uh, yeah. of your patch. Yeah, so it could just be the area divided by, yeah, I think it's the area. So you can the area of the map. Uh, yeah, but the, it's the effective area, so you need to weight it by the, uh, the taper, but this is going to be approximate. Nope, that's the wrong W2, because it's I just over in the previous W2. Okay, so that's reasonably accurate. In, in reality, you have to, uh, in reality, you have to like weight the area by the taper. And there's a simple way to, to do that that I can't think of right now, but, but yeah, so that's pretty cool. So you've calculated the uh, power spectrum both using FFTs and by using square for harmonic transforms. And they agree reasonably well. And you're again seeing the acoustic oscillations in the CMB calculated in different ways. And we've learned that I guess we learned that Lipshot doesn't have ring weights for the old active acquisition, but the upcoming maps in CA are, uh, you know, you can easily calculate a, 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 the harmonic transform of that uh, and then and then do power spectra with it. Um, on the yeah. What, one thing that would be nice if somebody knows how to do it is to add the ring weights for other uh, pixelizations. Currently, we just support the ones that are out of the box in Lipshot. I should say ring weights are only needed for the map to ALM direction. ALM to map is supported for any pixelization that has, um, that can be expressed as equispaced rows of pixels. So equispaced in the horizontal direction, but arbitrary spacing in the vertical direction. So ALM to map is much more general than map to ALM in, uh, because of the ring weights. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all I wanted to cover in this tutorial. We're almost at the two hour point. Um, feel free to ask any other questions, any comments, uh, any requests for how to do things with Pixel.
It's very useful, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you indeed. Thank you everyone for joining. And uh, have fun with Pixel. <laughs> bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 bye, -bye.